Hi everyone, warm welcome to our first Me Vision Academy Award handover this year, 2024. It's wonderful to be with you, myself, Adrian Grunewald, and Louis Grunewald, the old man. Today we'll be giving a successful leadership award to Craig Comrie. We'll introduce him in a, in a moment. And after doing that, we will have an interview with him on leadership and exactly what the award is about so that we can all learn from one another and inspire greater leadership out there or more successful leaders. Very quickly, our vision is to mobilize 30,000 successful leaders by countries, by organizations, sectors, and levels. So all the way from CEO down where we can by 2030. So 30,000 successful leaders by 2030. And we start with the leaders at the top. They're often easier and more visible to read as to whether they're successful or not. So, uh, it, you know, they... They're easier to read. When you go further down in an organization, it's not that easy to necessarily see visibly who the successful leaders are. So we're starting at the top. And um, our leader today is the CEO of ProfMed. His name is Craig Comrie. He's been leading this organization successfully for five years plus. And he's also the chairperson of HFA, Health Funders Association. So they're playing a role uh, as far as universal health coverage is concerned, and also, I guess, engaging the government around national health insurance bill, which must be quite interesting. We'll talk a little bit about that towards the end, although today is not about that. So, Craig Comrie, a warm welcome and congratulations. We have been watching you for years. We've been tracking you for years, if I can put it that way, and have no doubt that you deserve this award. It's good to be with you. Thanks and good to be with you, Adrian and Louis. It's really a privilege and a privilege to receive the award. I'm going to show it to everyone very briefly and then we'll get into the meat of the conversation. So let me share here. It's an exclusive recognition of successful leadership awarded to Craig Comrie for consistently leading self successfully. That's part of our tracking, I guess. We know that he does this. Uh, he'll tell you he's not perfect at it, but he you can't do what he's doing without achieving that. Also consistently leading people successfully in a very professional organization for professionals, if I can put it that way. But successfully leading as CEO at ProfMed for over five years. And of course, before that, being a very successful executive within the Momentum Group. I know it changed a little bit over the years, but also then positively impacting broader society. He's a father. He's a leader in his church community. And on various fronts, he's playing a role, uh, as I said now, also in the future of South Africa's health. And then finally, his commitment to mentoring, inspiring future successful leaders inside and outside his work environment. I'm one of the co-founders of Me Vision Academy. And that's our slogan, Journey to Best Self. That's really the slogan. But we add the word confidence because when you achieve your best self, you actually portray a genuine confidence. So that's the award. Well done, um, Craig Comrie. And we will send you the original. I'm going to stop sharing here so that we can see all of us as we head into the conversation. The first part is leading self. And we have a slogan, as I said, leading towards your best self. What are your thoughts and comments on that component of leading? What have you learned about it from the call over the years? The leading's more about example, and I guess. Um, from a young age, I was lucky to be surrounded by many leaders. So both in the home and, and, and in the workplace and certainly um, in a church as well and through, through faith-based um, education and leadership opportunities. I think much of um, my leadership skills were, were built in the home and, and at church. And then, and then that gives you a foundation and a fundamental foundation to actually lead elsewhere with integrity, which I think is is probably the most important part of of, uh, of leadership as well. So, so let's just unpack leading self towards your best self. What do you think are the important components there, Craig? I mean, obviously, it can be different for different people. I guess you have physical, spiritual, emotional, all those things. But what stands out in your mind? What have you tried to do? Even the finer things. So, so maybe you have a bad temper early in life and you work on that, you know, there's nothing like a family who brings out all your weaknesses and I guess your strengths as a father, as a husband. But, but what, what, what have you worked on over the years? Any comments on any leaders on that journey where some leaders, I guess, believe if they qualify themselves well and they are successful, you know, quickly and they make a lot of money that they are successful and they skip almost that 
personal leadership component, which we're discussing is a very dangerous mm -hmm. thing that catches up with you. Any comments on that? I think what you have to quickly learn is that leadership is constantly adapting and learning, and you always need to be open to the new lessons that come your way. I think um, as a young person or as a start and trying to get um, qualified and get into the business world, you what's really important is, is discipline. So you have to learn um, self-management and discipline. You have to make sure that you're chasing the goals. And if you're chasing the wrong goals, make sure that you adapt quickly um, and and correct your action where you need to. So I do think at at a, at a start, make sure that despite challenges that you might come across, that you're still chasing the goal and that you're disciplined in yourself. Um, so when I started um, studying, I didn't have the opportunity to attend full-time university. So I studied part-time and luckily got articles to pursue becoming a chartered accountant. But that was tough. Um, but I, I quickly learned that people must tell me that I can't do it and, and I'm going to do my best to prove them, them wrong. And so in some of that comes my motivation. So when you get to these big hills that uh, maybe nobody wants to climb or, or you think it's impossible, you need to just challenge yourself and, and, and go for it and do it. And, and it takes a lot of endurance um, and hard work. And so that means that you have to do a lot of a resetting of priorities, um, making sure that you're disciplined enough to spend the time chasing the goal. And did you find initially your qualification, it's a good qualification. I think many years ago, it was even a better qualification, still a good qualification being a chartered accountant, but there was a time when if you became a CA, you're probably just destined to do well. That's it. You know, it was just such a good qualification. Um, but but did you find at some stage you realized, wow, you know, this technical quali qualification is not what it's about. Um, you can't kind of leave it behind. I'm sure it's always played a role in your life, the discipline of thinking things through and, 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 and processing. But somewhere in your career, it shifted to people, I guess. You know, it's not so much about technical knowledge anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I've always wanted to, um, I, I always saw uh, being qualified as a means to get to where I wanted to be. I, I never saw myself as being an auditor or just a chartered accountant. In fact, my first employer, when he interviewed me, the CEO of Metropolitan Health Group at the time said, um, listen here, you, you just don't have the, um, you don't have the look and feel. And when we speak to you, you don't, you don't feel like an accountant. So who are you? It was a very pertinent question about who I was, because you're not your qualification. Um, uh, it opens doors to uh, what you can become. And I think I used that opportunity to get involved with certainly um, managing people. And my first job was, was a turnaround specialist in terms of the finance department. Uh, and I quickly realized it wasn't about the systems, even though they were important, the IT systems, the admin systems that surrounded everything. It was the people that made things happen. And uh, and I learned, I had some good uh, learning experience in managing um, a smaller team and larger team and then a larger business unit. Getting to understand the people that you work with is the biggest difference that you will make as a leader. Um, but it's also the biggest difference that that those people make in your life as well. So mm. I've, I've always worked within, um, within the people context, not the systems or the outcomes only, even though, even though that's important, it's an important part of what you need to do. Uh, and so I've enjoyed the people and uh, those relationships extend for years, despite moving uh, positions and changing jobs, those relationships uh, have always been there and uh, I've kept them going. Uh, we're certainly going to talk next about people. Now, how important are people really in leadership as opposed to, uh, and you've already sort of steered us in that direction and we'll also look at, ask the old man for a comment. We happen to know your parents. Okay? Just your view on that foundation in one's life. You know, very often, very often one can be a chartered accountant, but there's this, that's maybe part of what that CEO felt, is what is it in you that I'm feeling that's different? Um, you know, great parents, I think your dad maybe even steered you to some degree in the direction that you studied uh, with wisdom, but, but huge integrity strong spiritual foundation, strong um, uh, care, you know, it's just service 
sort of a strong service background. And there's so much yeah. there that one can easily underestimate in terms of how it built your character that people feel when they meet you and they engage you. Yeah, uh, family makes makes the biggest difference. I think uh, I was privileged to grow up in a in a household where where um, education was an important part. Um, but in education followed um, the fundamentals of of faith and and being consistent and and being um, I guess introspective about what you are and who you are and what you're doing. And so my parents taught me very very early about the value of of a person and and who you are and so I, I i certainly benefited immensely from that very consistent teaching from my parents they lived what they believed and they do live what they believe still now i still have the privilege of them being around and and relying still relying on on the wisdom that comes from them because they've been through some of the things i haven't been through mm. um and even the things we went through as a as a young family quickly taught us about the importance of having a, a sure foundation in terms of a spiritual foundation. Um, and then moving into a space where, I mean, we're a, we're a mighty, interesting family. So two of my sisters, my older sisters, have BCOMs, luckily in marketing and personnel management. But me and the younger brother are accountants. So you can see the consistency in the value of, I guess my father always said, and his experience might have been, in a space where in his career, he probably was halted to an extent because he didn't have the right qualification. So this push to have the right uh, qualification that opened up opportunities for you was very real. Mm. Um, but it is a space that in the home that you can learn um, to progress and celebrate how you progress um, and, uh, and and fail and get up and and start again and um, and be strengthened okay. through the experience and learn through the experience. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I think that is, I do have a privileged background, not not because we had money, because I don't think we did have lots of money, um, but because we had that sure foundation and grounding. Yeah, I know. What a blessing. Old man, before we go on to people, leading people successfully, which is the second component of the award, uh, any quick comments? Uh, Craig, we... We've learned um, over the years to define levels of confidence. Um, now, for instance, confidence is easily defined out there in many different ways, as you know, different kind of confidence. But we find in the uh, modern pressure situations uh, of individuals and families, the only kind of confidence that is trustable is that that you have in your, in your true self. Where you really are, um, the other kind of confidence tends to be shaken all the time. Your feelings on that? Yeah, I agree with the the saying that you that you can't fake it to make it. I, I don't believe that's true. I think what you can do is you can build your confidence by doing things that are right, and where you fail, you learn quickly, and and you move along and don't make those mistakes again. So I, I I'm I'm in agreement that. That starts at a at, at a young age, um, and then your confidence grows as the challenges happen. So I think what you do need is the challenges in life to grow your confidence. Um, and as you get through them, you realize that your capabilities are far more than you even would have thought. One of the, the big uh, real obstacles I thought I had in my life was speaking in public. Um, and I struggled with that. I struggled with speaking in public, and I'd avoid it as much as possible, um, only, be to, uh, only to be recruited into a role where I headed up marketing for a period and had to stand in front of big panels and present business propositions and, and value propositions. And so um, slowly that confidence came because of the, the challenges that you prepare to face and you prepare to get over them. Um, and so I think you build that confidence. I think maybe some are gifted with that talent, but certainly it's something I've had to work very hard at. Thanks, Craig. So people, you know, we are finding more and more that leadership is about power. Okay, leaders have power. Now it can be good and bad power. And, and uh, you know, we also talk about the P's in power. 
So, so leaders often uh, portray the power or they um, practice the power through the P's, which is position. So you can have power through your position or prestige uh, or prosperity, possession. So the wealthier you are, the more power you have through uh, profits, you know, uh, performance. So the more I perform, the more power I have. And so you go through all these P's. There's also through um, purpose. There's a lot of power in, in driving uh, through purpose. There's people. There's another P, you know, power through people. And so one can even find more uh, P's that leaders often use to practice their power, to get things done. How, how do you place people, the P of people, in this list of P's through which leaders practice power? And, and how, how have you discovered where people fit in in terms of leadership? I mean, there's, there, there's tasks that you have to achieve. There's performance, obviously. There's a vision that you're driving. There's a purpose. Where do you think people fit? Well, look, people fit right in the middle of it. Uh, I'm not sure how useful it is being a leader of of things other than of people. So um, performance in a company is is great, but it's it becomes historic very quickly. So as a finance guy, it's easy to report on the profits and to show your achievements, um, but it tends to be done through people. And so the consistent performance, and so the power of performance in my mind comes from the people that you have. And so if I look at the current team that I have at ProfMed, I mean, I have an amazing team uh, that has been uh, put together over years in terms of their wisdom, their experience, their talents, even some of the disruptive elements <laughs> that come into a business are quite useful. And so you quickly get to learn how to best utilize that to improve the business as a whole. And you do that through the different collection of talents and experiences and wisdom of the people that you are uh, privileged to to lead. And so your performance is never your own performance. It's a reflection on your whole your whole business. Um, mm. You're lucky for this point in time maybe to be the leader, but you need other people who lead in different aspects um, in, in the business side. So I place people right at the top of that list for um, consistent performance. And that's where, in my mind, the power of a leader comes in. It's, it's actually... How can you utilize um, the people and grow their ambitions and their levels of um, job satisfaction, career satisfaction, while you achieve the performance that, that is required by maybe your shareholders or other stakeholders in the business? So if you had to speak to the younger Craig of 20 years ago, starting out in his career, what would you tell him about leading people that's most important, authentically important? Uh, that you wish you knew then, you know, the age-old question. So just so that yeah. you can learn quicker and be better than you, <laughs> you know, yeah. you learn through a hard experience perhaps. Yeah, I, I, I would have said to him, um, consider the people a little bit more in terms of climbing the corporate ladder, that you you can you can climb it, but you never climb that ladder alone. Um, and so I think it's something that I – realize now looking back more so than when I was uh, climbing the corporate ladder. And I, I would have said, hey, there was more opportunity to actually uplift and engage people. And I probably missed a few of those opportunities on the way. Lovely. All right. Yeah, people are, you know, a guy taught me the principle of duck one day, different, unique, complex. So if you have a team, I don't know what your executive team is like, eight or six or 10, you know, each of them are different, unique and complex. So you have a team dynamic and different skills required there, I guess, but then you have one-on-one -on -one dynamic with people. Have you have you found that? I mean, the moment you put your team in a room, it's, it's a different yeah. dynamic when you go one-on-one. -on -one. Where does the real change happen when you sit and dynamically speak to the team or one-on-one? -on -one? Yeah, I think the change happens in both both places. So what, what I've tried to instill in my people is to be themselves when it comes to the larger forum. So as we sit on an executive committee, make sure that they're not going with the flow, that they need to still bring their question in mind in terms of what, what is the direction, what is the outcome we require, and what they believe they can bring to the equation. Um, I tend to employ people that do that questioning 
um, and not people that are just going to come along for the ride. And I think it's in that space that you you really need to understand the individual's context, where they come from, and the way they do things, and then be able to help them channel that energy in the right places in the business. And perhaps it leads to some dynamic or um, uh, some very vocal meetings in cases, um, but it always means that you get to a better outcome than just putting forward an answer in at the start. So I've, I've been through that process or I go through that process daily, sometimes weekly and monthly, but it's a regular occurrence. And I, I certainly feel that it gives people not only a voice, but a, a reason to be there, a purpose. And I think you spoke about purpose earlier. Um, and purpose drives the best motivation. Uh, well, it is the motivation on why people are there in the first place. And so you need to be able to tie that into whatever business you're, you're leading or whatever group of people you're leading. Yeah. Craig, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you now, you know, the third component is you've led ProfMed, obviously, successful enough for over five years now. Um, and, and, and what has been the elements of that? Why have you managed to be successful as an organization? Before we get there, old man, anything you want to say or, or, or summarize or ask? Just one uh, question. Uh, Craig uh, uh, demonstrates understanding of the need for confrontation as opposed to contention. Uh, knowing him, I know that he hates contention as such, but I don't think he's afraid of the need of confrontation in all honesty. Your feelings on that, Craig? Yeah, it's interesting because I think at in times you don't always know what the difference might be. Um, and it goes back to purpose. And, and if you know that people are trying to achieve a better outcome, then the purpose for me isn't contention. The purpose mm -hmm. is confronting an issue so that you achieve a better outcome. Uh, so I, I do see it in, in that way. There are times where you aren't sure exactly where everybody sits. Um, and you have to navigate your way through that, that space quite, quite well and carefully without being personal about it. And I think that's the issue. You, you, contention becomes a personal issue with a personal motive, while confrontation sometimes means there's something wrong that, if it is made right, improves the business or improves the outcome. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's probably my best descriptor on, on, on how I would tell the difference. Thank you. I like, I like the three Cs. There's conflict, there's confrontation, and there's contention. Conflict is good because it means difference. You know, conflicting team members, conflicting views. Uh, if it's handled well, then it can result in something better. Confrontation is I need to confront you. You're not performing or you're not happy or, or there's an issue between two people. Let's confront the issue. Contention is when there's argumentation and it's just argument and it's just destructive. So it's, as you say, very well put. It's difficult for leaders to sometimes navigate through which one am I busy with? And we use the words wrongly. We say, hey, we mustn't have any conflict in our team. Be careful of saying you need conflict. You just said it earlier, you know, people who question. Yeah. So leadership is interesting managing those three C's. Uh, so let's just, I mean, we're not technical. We're not uh, insurance or medical insurance gurus or anything. So, but, but it also helps other leaders realize that I've got to lead myself. I've got to lead my people and I've got to lead the organization itself. So one of the, the success um, legs of this table called ProfMed why have you been successful in leading the organizational side? And some of it obviously is, is, is separate from the people. But once you've got the people down, then most of it is done. Just your views on the actual organization. Yeah, so speaking outside just the people, which I think are still core to every success, um, ProfMed originated from a few dentists getting together and creating a, a medical society to look after their healthcare needs. So in its purest sense, um, it's not, there's no shareholder involved other than the members who own the scheme. And so maybe from an integrity perspective, that just speaks to me directly, is to say we, we aren't answerable at all to a shareholder with a profit motive. We're answer, answerable to every single member of ProfMed who effectively trusts us with, with their families to take care of them. 
And so it's one of the things that in my own career has always attracted me to the medical scheme environment because it is that care element and it is different balancing the financing of healthcare or of care um, and realizing that there is not enough resources and trying to make the decisions on what care do you fund and what care don't you fund. And it's a and so it's very it's a very dynamic space to operate in, um, especially if you're an accountant. <laughs> so um, it's something that has drawn me to profit made in terms of its own purpose. And you're speaking to um, a group of highly educated people with a purpose of taking care of themselves and their families um, and and making sure that they try to do the best they can for their families and they're trusting that to to our business. And so um, for us, it's a, it's a really important responsibility to do that well. Again, and uh, I mean, part of the... Part of the dynamic for, for our business is also um, we see, um, despite you being well qualified, professionals actually drive um, the biggest part of small businesses in South Africa. So they employ a very large grouping, but within a small business context, if you think of a doctor and a practice, a lawyer and, and an accountant and their practices, working um, even engineers, working in their business spaces, they tend to employ eight or 10 people at least. Mm. So um, one of the real big push um, from, from my perspective and something I've learned is that we need more professionals in the country if we are going to um, address things like the unemployment uh, rates because it's those professionals that tend to have the means but also the ability to innovate quite quickly. So your target market, is it also a corporate environment, uh, you know, managers, senior people uh, with certain degrees? I mean, you you don't just confine yourself to people people who belong to professional bodies like engineers, lawyers, and so on. Um, just, just define that very quickly. Yeah, so, so we accept anybody who has a degree um, or a postgraduate qualification. Uh, what we have seen over the last few years, and in fact, ProfMed's own eligibility has changed, where we recognize leaders of industry. So it's sometimes difficult to, to pick up, um, but regardless of their professional qualifications, we've acknowledged people who are leaders in their industry and they're also welcome to join ProfMed. So there's a slight adaptation. We've seen people very highly self-taught in terms of what they know and lead their own businesses very successfully. And uh, so that the overall or historic or traditional definition of a professional is changing and changing quickly. Um, so we're we're keeping up with with that change as and when it happens. So would a, would someone who's a general manager at Vodacom, uh, but they don't have a professional qualification, they may have a BA degree or they may have I mean, no, not even any degree, but they're really successful in their career that they could qualify typically to be a prof. Mate. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, that, that type of scenario. And so what we see is in, in the corporate spaces, so most of our members come from the, the smaller business spaces. So the corporate spaces tend to have subsidy policies that only accredit certain medical schemes. But what we have seen a growing trend is amongst qualified individuals, they're on cost of company um, employment contracts and they get to choose where, where they want to get their medical cover from. But most of our business is from um, individuals, so individuals and small businesses. Mm, very interesting. So uh, before we just share our vision with you, just your thoughts on it, and, and then a little bit on the national health insurance journey, um, you, 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 we know that you have a commitment, be it probably in your professional life, but certainly also outside of it, to just developing people, make, helping people achieve their best selves. We think one of the most important things we can do as leaders is to develop other leaders, to grow other leaders, to bring out the best in people. And and that doesn't mean positionally. It's just when you help someone bring out their best self, they will lead. Directly, indirectly, they will lead. It's just the way it is. So part of the award is also recognizing that you're doing that. But tell us a little bit about your commitment to mentoring, inspiring future successful leaders, directly, indirectly, your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that the older you get, the, the more you realize that you need a growing 
um, younger generation to take over. They need to do better than you're doing. Uh, sometimes we think that that uh, we're growing the leadership grouping just to do what we're doing. We aren't. We're actually trying to inspire and mentor people to actually do better than what we are currently doing. In fact, um, in time, we need people who solve things differently. I still say with a fundamental level of integrity and a way of doing things, but they need to find different solutions to some of the problems that I guess our generation has been struggling with for many years. And so it's how to embrace that and make sure that you aren't limiting that amongst the, the individuals that you engage with, speaking to them as, as a person, speaking to them to encourage them. I think for the most, we see lots of people um, losing interest and, and being in a medical scheme space, lots of people that are struggling with being discouraged about the job market, about their career uh, progression and so forth. And, and they're almost bailing out rather than just enduring and fighting it a little bit further on. And then that change makes, or those changes then come. And so I think if there's anything, it's, it's that encouraging space to, to share with people to say, hey, we, we believe in the next generation. We believe that people can do much more than they think they can do. Um, and maybe that's where some of the faith comes in as well. So I think you, you choose to have faith in individuals and in, in people rather than judging them. Um, and you help them to achieve what they can achieve. So I think that's an important part of any mentoring process is to recognize the individual um, and balance it with some realistic um, feedback. I, I think we need to get people to accept realistic and constructive feedback and not see it as just criticism, but then encourage and help people to that next level. Um, and so, yeah, I'm looking forward to the person who who steps into, into my role into the future and seeing what they can do with it. And, and I'd feel, personally, I'd feel a failure if it's not good. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a very good point. We cannot groom leaders to run things the way we have. A lot of leaders want that. Uh, um, by default, they've got to be better mm. than us. Our kids must be better than us. And often that's not the case, unfortunately, uh, because the world is just pulling the other way. Um, now, we, we've, we've set ourselves on a course where we go out to find successful leaders. And, and you've see, seen some of the names that, that we've recognized uh, like we're recognizing you now. But we've realized also that's why we came with our vision, which is hashtag 30,000 successful leaders. That's the hashtag, but it's by 2030. And that's a very big task just in South Africa, shall we say. But we're going to do this, hopefully, in every country, just to be audacious for a moment. Uh, what we've realized is that, you know, you can give the CEO of Vodacom a recognition, but he's only there because there are many other successful leaders in his organization. Only one can be the CEO. ProfMed, we're recognizing the CEO of ProfMed, Craig Comrie, today, and no doubt you realize, we realize that you're not the only successful leader in your organization. How, continually recognizing these successful leaders on all levels. So that is our ambition and our goal is by 2030 to have recognized much in the same way, but it won't be interviews, but it will be, look, call it a successful leadership certificate in that sense, not an award. To find them, but by industry, by level, by country, and literally our platform that we've built a great investment can do that where you can literally we'll show it to you you can mobilize on all those levels and and globally so we can go by country and see how many successful leaders we have we can go by industry insurance so that is our ambition and our goal craig um, your thoughts on our audacious goal to do this well it's what we need i, I think um in south africa we too thinly spread we need leadership at different levels. Um, and that's how we improve the performance of South Africa in general. I think I'm, I'm a huge advocate to building the South African value proposition. Um, and I say this having siblings scattered throughout the world. Mm. I think South Africa still is a wonderful place to be and a wonderful place to actually learn and achieve success. What we have to do is make sure that we stretch that leadership capability into a number of different levels in business, in, in the public sector. Um, and then, we, then we'll then we succeed together. Um, and so there is a lot of 
a lot of work to be done in developing that leadership, those different leadership levels. So Thanks. I absolutely agree with your vision. Thank you so much. Old man, before we have just a minute or two on the NHI, which I think is a controversial thing, but a lot of people don't know much about it, uh, but it can impact all of us, no doubt. And you seem to be in the middle of this battle, um, hopefully for a good outcome, not just um, you know an ego battle that, that we often find in on so many fronts. Just final comments, maybe, old man, uh, on what Craig has said and your thoughts and feelings. Craig, what what you discovered that means a lot to me personally as well is we're speaking of the principle of recognizing our value proposition, the way you put it, in other words, and then of course developing that as well. Um, we have found a remarkable impact, uh, even in my, my immediate contact with people, in recognizing genuinely the, the qualities in them that are already there. Uh, for instance, you know so many people who have a covenantal relationships and, and so on, but do they really? really embrace the depth and the value of what they already have, even their existing qualifications and experience. So there's a serious tendency for people to under, undervalue what they have. Um, in a sense, one can't really speak of developing quality leadership. We don't also help people understand the, the tremendous value of that which they already are. Your feelings? I think key to actually developing any leadership skill is to recognize the individual and what they bring to the table. So recognize the individual's talent. Um, it's not, and I think we spoke earlier, it's not qualification. It's not a certificate. Um, the leadership actually needs to develop from, from earlier than just getting a qualification um, at a university or some level of, of, of a piece of paper. It needs to be something that is proven over time, that is that is built. I, I spoke earlier about building leadership capabilities and skills and talents. Um, I, I, I subscribe to the space where some people may be talented um, and talented leaders, others have to build it um, and, and need to endure and learn the lessons of life to, to build that type of capability. And so I think we, we have a, a mixture of, of both in our business or, or, or public sector at the moment. I think we need more in terms of being able to assist and empower the building of that leadership skill. Thanks. It's, it's interesting. I know you love sport. You certainly played a lot of sport when you were younger. I don't know what you do now. Too busy, maybe. But, you know, you've got the best talent in the Springbok team, but they train harder than <laughs> than those below them. Uh, could ever train so so you've got some mm -hmm. people with talent some that must be developed but you've got those with talent that must continue developing and it's the same mm -hmm. with your exco team you, you have the best you know refining over the last few years you've got the best but okay if they're the springbok team in the in the medical health industry then um they need to keep developing themselves but the difference is the springboks are developing themselves more than they play as leaders we play more than we develop because we're in on the field five six days a week while the Springboks in a good season or the whoever, the, you know, it's once a week. So there's a few dilemmas in, in developing leadership, mm -hmm. um, but to keep them sharp and, and effective. I just we talk about, is this finally, and, and then we will ask you for a final message as well. We talk about universal health coverage, and then we have this national health insurance bill that has been looming for years, actually. And maybe when it reared its head a few years ago, I don't know how long it's been, Craig, but um, maybe you weren't that involved then, and maybe you didn't realize that you would be in the middle of it as a CEO of ProfMed right now. So tell us where that is, and 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 what are you trying to achieve from the uh, what's the organization you're part of, the chairperson, Health Funders Association? Health. Yeah, yeah. Give us a bit yeah. of so the health. Yeah, maybe I could just maybe a word on on your preamble there as well as. It's amazing what a difference a coach does to a team. And team books are effectively uh, proof of that. So, um, and then in terms of of uh, universal healthcare coverage, is always an ambition that that we have that everybody has the opportunity to access the health that they need or the healthcare that they need. 
So obviously at different stages of your life, you're going to have different needs and different um, needs to access either a doctor or um, it could be a nurse or just some, some medicine. And the whole idea about universal healthcare access means that nobody um, is left behind. Nobody, because they don't have enough money, is left behind and cannot access what they need in terms of healthcare. Well, that's uh, a good thing. That's, that's a good that's thing. a good thing absolutely um and it's something that we should admire and so um when national health insurance was first raised um in 2008 um and it has been a debate since then it was raised that this would be the answer on how we achieve universal health care and so the debates have continued over all the years and i guess the frustration sometimes is that um, all the debates and planning and what we have is eventually the National Health Insurance Bill, which is about to be signed into, into law by the president, has gone through so many years of engagement and consultation, yet there are a few key items of the bill that totally um, misses the point of providing access to health for everybody. And so some of the bill is very damaging in terms of of the healthcare system assets. So the fact that we have got, and we've been able to retain very highly skilled healthcare service providers, and I'm talking doctors and specialists and even highly skilled nurses at this stage is, is in fact a miracle when we compare ourselves to other developing countries. Mm. Um, and so the real unintended consequence of, of a national health insurance bill and the one that we have in front of us means that we risk losing that very important asset. And then we actually are doing the opposite. We restrict him access to health rather than enhancing universal health care coverage. And it's on that basis that um, many of us in the private sector in industry, specifically in the medical schemes environment, um, have petitioned and consulted and presented to parliament and provided commentary on this bill for more than a decade. Um, and I was there more than a decade ago. So we've done this for a very long time. Um, yet there is this, um, this ultimate push. And on a personal level, it's obviously there, there's some critical elections coming up and it all seems to come to a, a very big point uh, for South Africa at this point in time for us to make sure that whatever we get is correct. And whatever national health insurance bill is then accepted or signed into law is challenged where necessary. And perhaps the our earlier conversations all come to um, why I find myself in, in that position is to confront what should be confronted and trying to find the best alternative is something that I certainly still believe needs to be done when it comes to the national health insurance bill. And uh, whether that's through the courts and the court processes, we need to do our best to protect every mm -hmm. South African in the process. And so that's where we go. The Health Funders Association represents more than half of the members of, of medical schemes. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a specific interest, absolutely we do, but we acknowledge and want to contribute in a very meaningful way to making sure that every individual South African gets access to the right health care um, that they deserve. Uh, if it goes through the way it is right now, are we in trouble? Or was that an unfair question? Is it not that simple? Yeah, it's not that simple. I think the first point of call is that we've had lots of legislation that has been enacted yet never been implemented. So you need to consider that in, in this next step. So we know that the implementation of the National Health Insurance Bill, um, as shared by all the... Um, all the leaders in that space is said to be decades to come. So the first thing I want to assure people is, is not to panic. Don't panic about what the National Health Bill says correctly or incorrectly right now. We're going to fight the legislation part of it, but the real implications will ha happen in decades to come. Mm. Uh, but it is important still to comment and engage the legislation. And so we're doing that right now. Um, and hopefully the implementation can change in terms of how they see um, things like uh, one of the big aspects at the moment is a single payer model, which means that effectively through 
tax changes and so forth, that medical scheme premiums become and go to a centralized fund that, that is controlled solely by the government. Wow. Um, and so, and it limits then the choices that you have, even if you're willing to pay out of your own pocket, it limits the choices on how you can access health. So that part of the bill needs to be addressed um, quickly. And even if the president signs it into, into law, um, the medical schemes, because of we represent medical scheme members, we will be challenging that constitutionally. Hmm. Well, all the best with that. Good luck to 2024, as you say, it's, you know, you find a kind of sometimes find these um, animals, they get air in their heads and they just run around and go crazy. But before, before elections, you've got this craziness happening and we will have it in South Africa and you'll have it in the US and, and therefore we'll have it all over the world. And, and hopefully we can all navigate through all of this nonsense. And that's what leadership is for. And that's why we need to mobilize all these leaders so that we can just, you know, inspire them to, to, raise their game to mobilize more leaders and develop more leaders. Your final message to leaders in summary then about in your view, and I'm sure this view changes as you grow older and mature even more, um, what it means to be successful at leading. Yeah, the success is demonstrated um, by the people that follow. And uh, I think it's, it's in how you grow people um, and how you contribute to their successes that eventually makes you a leader. Um, you will change careers a number of times, maybe professions even. You'll change the <laughs> businesses you operate in, um, but you want what you leave behind to be successful, and usually it's the people that will make that happen. And so for me, it's all about making sure that you develop, you inspire, you encourage uh, people to do better and be better the next day than where they were the previous day and eventually in time you'll see them become become great Greg Comrie CEO of ProfMed uh, just the final view here of the award that we give you successful leadership Greg Comrie for those specific uh, reasons and more leading self people ProfMed over five years broader society including on the health side that we've just had a discussion around but then for us, super important is just making sure we keep growing good leaders in this environment that we find ourselves in. So again, congratulations. Thank you for your time. And uh, we hope to check in with you on, on this health bill and keep leading away. We, we, we really need you. And hopefully we can talk to you about recognizing the other successful leaders in your organization. We need to do that, mobilize them and, and send them forth. All the best. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian and Louis. We really... Well, I really appreciate you and uh, all the success for 30,000. I think you'll hit there quite quickly and then maybe the next target, eh? Yeah, we'll see. I think we probably need 200,000. So. Yep, we do, we but there are, there are so many. In fact, there are more successful leaders than we realize. It's just a, there's so much yeah. negativity around that we, as you say, when I mean, they're scattered, let's just bring them together and then have that one place where they are and, and and then from there, there's great power, you know, great power when you unite a bunch of successful leaders. Uh, but right now, they're everywhere. And, um, yes. and we just need to recognize and, and, and move forward. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.